This is Don Wick from the Red River Farm Network. We are celebrating women in agriculture throughout this month of March. It's a special series we're calling Agriculture, and we're hearing all the great stories this month. It's been a lot of fun. Our guest today is Val Arsbold, a great friend, uh, executive director of the Minnesota FFA Foundation. Val, thanks a ton for joining us for this uh, program. Well, thank you, Don. It's, you know, a privilege to talk about agriculture. It's it's how I grew up and, and then I continue to do that even after living on a farm. So it's a, a good part of my life. Well, tell me about your start. You're, you, you said you grew up on a farm. Yeah, so I'm the, the fifth and youngest child to my parents that have a had a farm near Goodhue in Goodhue County. Uh, we raised everything back in the days when you had quite a bit of, of a lot of things. So we were a dairy beef sheep farm. And then when we went in the dairy buyout, apparently we had too much free time because then we went into raising pigs and we were part of the swine industry. And so, you know, we had about 150 to 200 of each of those species at any one time, which at the back in that day kept us all pretty busy, but that's the way we liked it. Um, got a chance to, to drive tractor, you know, move manure, uh, feed the calves. Those types of things were all part of kind of how I uh, grew up and recognized the importance of working hard. And FFA certainly has been a part of your, your story all the way back to high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, you know, my first memory of the FFA is seeing my dad's jacket hang in the house. And I have to admit, it was a little bit ratty when you think back to how we keep take care of our jackets and stuff now, but they were very much a part of their clothing and they just wore them out and about. And so uh, my dad was involved in the FFA, my older siblings were in the FFA, and I, you know, fell in love with the idea. And I was very um, uh, involved right away as a freshman learning the creed. Uh, you know, getting involved with other activities, leadership activities, general livestock judging, public speaking, those types of uh, activities kept me busy. And in fact, you were a state officer, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, yeah, I really fell in love with it. So I applied for and was fortunate to be elected as the state FFA secretary uh, back in 1990. So that was certainly a pivotal point for me. I realized that FFA could and would take me many places, and it certainly has. So we talked this month about women in agriculture. Where were we as far as, as uh, young women coming into the organization of FFA at that time? Oh, back then, boy, you know, I guess I don't know the percentage, but I, I was the only girl in my freshman ag class. And so, you know, I'm assuming that was kind of similar across the state. So, you know, maybe 10% of, of the membership was young ladies at the time. I could be off. Uh, but, you know, what was really cool is that once I got in there, I could tell that my teacher was very supportive of me being there. And he really wanted me to try things and be successful. So uh, as I continued on and served in that state officer role, by that time, four out of the six of us were young ladies. Uh, in the FFA, and now our FFA membership in the state is about 50% young ladies. So tell me, what was it like being a state officer, that camaraderie, I'm guessing, that you guys form as a team? Yeah, you know, we learned a lot. You know, I to this day, I still do a lot of the things that I learned that year. So uh, for those who are my age or older, you might remember Paul Day was a very, uh, you know, prominent, intimidating, you know, talented professional. And he expected a lot from us. And I think because of that, we delivered a lot. Uh, we tend to arrive 10 minutes earlier than the meeting because that was very much part of what we were supposed to do. And uh, but as a team, we really developed um, an ability to read each other and read their strengths and to play off of that. So, you know, if I looked at back at my team, you know, I knew who was going to take this type of project and run with it. I knew what I was going to offer. And it really was a, a beautiful opportunity to develop skills as a, as a member of a team. So you went on to the University of Minnesota and eventually we're talking to you now as a head of the, the foundation, but you were an ag teacher for, for uh, the start of your career. 
Yeah, the fun part about that is that my um, my sister had gotten an ag education degree from River Falls. And, you know, I asked her why. And she said, well, this degree is wide open. You can do whatever you want to do. So that's really how I chose that degree was because I thought, well, I'd love to go into agriculture. I don't fully know what I want to do. Uh, but then I student taught. And my student teaching experience went fine, but it wasn't necessarily like the easiest. Uh, but I still thought, you know what, I'll give this teaching thing a try. And so for seven years, I was a teacher, an agriculture teacher, loved every moment of it. Uh, first in the community of Wilmer, I was part of a very big program at that time. We had five instructors. Now that's becoming a little more common. It was by far an oddity back then, uh, loved it. Then we moved to the community of Plainview and I taught beside my husband, Paul, who's also an agriculture teacher loved it. Uh, but as our third child was born and ultimately we, ultimately we have a family of five kids, uh, you know, those those time, types of time commitment and the resources, something had to give. And so I made a phone call and asked uh, somebody on the state FFA uh, team if there were any opportunities. And they said, yeah, we've, we've got one. It's a part time thing. And and that was 23 years ago already that I started working with the Minnesota FFA Foundation. Thank you that family connection. You talked about your dad. Obviously, uh, you taught alongside Paul, your, your husband. Your kids have been very active in, in FFA. In fact, uh, I believe two of them were state presidents, right? Yeah, you know, it's been fun to watch them. They, they That's all they know. Like, they've been around FFA their entire life since they were uh, itty-bitty. And, you know, but it's been such a blessing. So you're you're right. Our Two of our boys did uh, serve as state officers and were fortunate to be state president. Uh, they have used those skills now and are doing, you know, incredible things to help uh, their communities and their families. But yeah, all five of our kids have found a really nice place in the FFA. So what's your role now with the, the head of the foundation? Yeah, so mine is really about developing partnerships to help advance uh, agriculture, food and natural resources in our state of Minnesota. Uh, and the FFA. And so when I define a partnership, it's kind of wide open. You know, how can we get people to understand the value of agricultural education and then partner with us in some way? So the obvious one is financial. For all of our programs to exist, we need to be able to support them financially. However, there's other ways that people are supporting us and it's also very important. Uh, being judges at our state FFA convention and other events, uh, getting involved in mentoring some of our students, uh, mentoring our teachers and developing partnerships that get that information into school classrooms is important as well. I think you said 23 years as the, the lead with the foundation. Through that time, there's been a lot of hallmarks. We started the uh, Minnesota FFA Hall of Fame, uh, the license plate project with uh, Minnesota 4-H and FFA together. What would you say are, are some of your career highlights that you've had during your tenure? Well, the agriculture plate is pretty cool because that one I do every now and then get to see when I'm driving down the road. And, you know, we hope those numbers continue to grow, but we know that we're already uh, 30,000 plus dollars have gone back to support programs that are our FFA programs. That additional 30,000 has gone to 4-H. So very, very proud of that program. I think, you know, the investment in teachers is one that I feel very proud of. When I started, the dollars came in and they went right to student programs. That's important, that's key. But without teachers, students don't know about those programs. They don't, uh, they're not encouraged to take advantage of those. So about 2012, we did a little bit of a broadening of what we do and what we support and we involved teachers. And so, you know, we have a teacher shortage in Minnesota. That is gonna be something I'll work passionately to help uh, to address here in our state, uh, but getting involved with those has been important. I was part of the um, team that raised the dollars for the Miracle of Birth Center at the State Fair. Uh, so when I go there, I'm always excited to know that I, you know, was in those meetings and advocating that this had a really important role for FFA in addition to the overall State Fair. So those are a few of them, but uh, at the end of the day, I equally love the Blue Jacket Bright Futures program. So I could probably go on for a while, but those are some of the big ones. 
it's fun to know that uh, that you've had a, an impact. I'm curious, Val, who, who are your mentors along the way? You know, I had a really good ag teacher, Mr. Lee Thompson. He was important because he right away said that I should do the creed. And I think that was a pretty big, uh, you know, kind of a big shift for me. I was a pretty timid person prior to that. Uh, and of course, my parents, you know, they were they were there uh, supporting me all along. And of course, I do now still adore having good conversations with my husband, Paul, and being able to strategize about how we can serve students and teachers. Very cool. Uh, this is a series about women in agriculture. Is there advice that you would give to uh, others that are looking at a career in agriculture? Just go for it. Just go for it. You know, when I started teaching, I was one of the early, early uh, teachers in the state. It's hard to believe that over 54% of our teachers now are females uh, because back when I joined, back in 94, I went into this conference room with, you know, 300 teachers, and I bet there were 10 of us young ladies in the room. And so I think my advice is just do it. Just get in there, uh, find those people you can ask questions of, and they can support you when it gets a little uncomfortable. They're going to help, you know, lift you up and make sure uh, that you have the support you need. Uh, but but just try it. You know, I, I, when I think about it, I really was amazing that I felt comfortable in that room as a, as a new teacher with all that expertise, with all that um, passion for ag education. Uh, but I did it and I stayed, I kept coming back. And uh, that would be, I think my advice is try it and then be resilient. Yeah. When you said that, I, my first thought was it would be kind of intimidating just to, to walk through those doors. Uh, when you got 300 plus uh, gentlemen that are, are in those ag teacher roles. Yeah, you know, and then that first year when I was a teacher and actually kind of a few years, you know, students, they really resemble what their families are used to. So if they're not used to a female agriculture teacher, the students are gonna let you know. And, you know, again, it's just, keep showing up, just continue to uh, share what you know. I, I will tell one funny story and I tell new teachers this all the time. I, at least it was funny now looking back, it wasn't at the time. <laughs> when I was uh, teaching uh, small engines, I thought if I told the students I knew a lot about engines, they would believe me because I had said, I had said it. Well, they spent every day of that semester proving all the things I didn't know. And so the next semester, wiser, I said to the kids, I know a number, I know quite a bit about engines, but I don't know it all. And if if we have a question that I don't know, I promise you this, I will help you find the answer. And it was a total mind shift for me where I quit pretending I knew it all and I let everybody be part of the team in solving the problem, solving the issue. And I think I take that lesson with me throughout life as well. Are there, we talked about uh, where you started. Are, are there any misconceptions, uh, anything that maybe uh, uh, a female teacher is facing today or, or is that behind us? I think there's still, you know, maybe a, not so much a misconception, but I think there's areas that as female teachers, we might not have been exposed to at the same level that our male counterparts were. And so we probably, I will just say, have to make a little bit more effort to learn about things like ag mechanics. Ag mechanics, for instance, was an area that I taught. Uh, it was funny, I taught with four men, but they gave me a lot of the, the ag mechanics classes. And at first it was very intimidating, but then I just studied and worked hard. And then they turned out to be my favorite classes. So I was your small engines, vehicle maintenance, welding teacher, if you were a student at Wilmer High School. And so I think, you know, misconception possibly, but the bigger issue really was we probably need to make sure they're exposed to things that they weren't exposed to growing up. Uh, and some of them really were. They had that same similar experience as, as the male counterparts. I, I just think about where FFA is today and so much focus on, on leadership and even things like policy and stuff that, uh, at least when I was wearing a blue jacket, that really wasn't the case. Yeah, it's fun that you mentioned that right now because we're getting ready for the egg policy experience uh, as well as the FFA day at the Capitol. And I think what's really neat is to think about giving students the opportunity to develop the skills. We're not telling them how to uh, feel about an issue, but we're in 
inviting them, encouraging them and facilitating them to develop their knowledge and their skills to go and talk to decision makers. So for this ag policy experience, they'll spend three days in St. Paul. They'll be visiting with agricultural lobbyists and those that are involved with policy. Uh, they'll meet with legislators, not advocating for a certain topic or cause, but developing the skills that they need so that they can go into their county commissioner's office and have a conversation uh, to their U.S. congressmen and women's office and, and really be wise as to the role that they have and can play. That's uh, very important. I think it's uh, those are our skills are going to take with them for, for a lifetime. Um, any final thoughts that uh, you'd like to share with us? You know, I just really think it's an exciting time. I, you know, I, of course, have dedicated my personal and professional life to a lot of FFA and ag education because I think it's important. And I, I think in Minnesota, especially, we're going to see tremendous growth because there's so much passion for students to achieve. Uh, achieve. Uh, we're graduating kids at about 10 percent higher rate than if they were not involved in our program. That's something to celebrate. That's something to invest in. We're going to see our FFA membership continue to grow and to blossom into, uh, you know, meeting the needs of kids. And so as I think about that, it's it's about partnerships. It's about getting out there and talking about our programs. And I, you know, as a female, I'm proud to have been a role model for other people. Uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunities out there and I'd love for, for young ladies and young men to join join agriculture and, and get involved and contribute back. It's a good time to be involved. No doubt. I would be remiss if I didn't uh have you give us a plug. If folks want to support FFA in Minnesota or in their state, how do they do that, Val? Yeah, check out our website. There certainly is a lot of information there. Uh, give me a call, drop me an email. We'd love to find the right way to that meets their desire to get involved, whether it's sponsoring a jacket, whether it's their business and they want to get involved and get some name recognition among our uh, 16,000 plus students that are in the FFA. We're gearing up for a state FFA convention, and that's April 21st through the 23rd, and we'd welcome people to come check it out, experience that excitement. I can't even fathom what we're preparing for, and that's about 7,000 FFA members from the state of Minnesota coming together to do uh, activities and to build themselves up to be better people. Uh, it's something to get involved with. What a fun conversation, Val. I sure appreciate you joining me. Thank you, Don. Always a pleasure. Val Arsbold with us, the uh, executive director of the Minnesota FFA Foundation. It is our celebration of women in agriculture, our special series called Agriculture.